Uh, well, welcome to the ISS. Summer's over and we're, we're back to school. And to start, um, we have our Hodokovsky saga, Power Politics and Legal Reform in Russia. Our speaker today is, is Jeffrey Kahn, Professor of Law at Southern Methodist University in Dallas. Uh, for the politic, political types among you, let me assure you, Jeff was a Russianist before he was a lawyer. Uh, he has his uh, doctorate uh, in Russian politics, looking particularly at Russian relations between the uh, federal center and some of the regions in the 1990s. That's from St. Anthony's College, Oxford. Um, he was, as noted in the introduction to, to this uh, meeting, one of the foreign academics who was actually write, asked to write a report um, on the uh, second Hodokovsky verdict. He's here for an hour. He will speak for approximately 30 minutes, then we'll open it up to q and I know we have a lot of expertise in the audience, so I want to make this as free-flowing as possible, which is why I've decided to limit my introductory remarks as much as possible. Jeff. Okay, well, thank you very much, Nick. Uh, it's very good to be here, uh, and especially uh, to be talking to this group. Uh, I'm looking forward to your questions. Not so much my answers, but definitely your <laughs> questions. Uh, when the NATO summit begins in Wales tomorrow, Russia's foreign incursions will, of course, be on the agenda, but not Russia's domestic affairs. That's as it should be, but too bad, I think, because that focus hides a common feature in both. President Putin's occasional abuse of international law runs on a parallel track to his occasional abuse of the Russian domestic legal system. The modus operandi is the same. When Russia violates law, it tends to do so by invoking law. When Russia annexed Crimea, it violated the territorial integrity of a sovereign state, a keystone principle of international law. But Russia clothed the violation with the claim of another international legal principle, the self-determination of peoples. Now, this was a masquerade, not a very convincing one for a variety of different audiences to the spectacle. But the same modus operandi that Putin sometimes applies in that area of law applies to Russian domestic law. The arrest, trial, and convictions of Mikhail Khodorkovsky expose numerous violations of fundamental legal principles. The state cast these actions as lawful and dressed them in all sorts of empty process, but this costuming was transparent. Trial observers were left wondering how the Kremlin could possibly expect them to view its judicial system as anything other than a mockery of actual criminal justice. Some felt that they were sitting in a theater, not a courtroom. My thesis is that the Kremlin was and is perfectly aware of that perception and not only tolerates it, but embraces it. Leaders in the Kremlin find value in the power to act occasionally in violation of the law. Not only that, but they see an additional value in being seen to do so with impunity. This demonstration is accomplished by dressing their actions in law engaging in a performance of legal theater. Of course, legal institutions are weakened when their boundaries with the political world are blurred in this way. The Kremlin, to the extent you let me speak of the Kremlin as a singular noun, knows this truth as well as we do. Putin, like each of his predecessors, wants legal institutions that are strong and competent because that's good for business and good for state administration. But he does not want them too strong or too competent, because that cultivates independence. And he faces pressure from other elites far less enlightened on such topics than he. Putin and the factions that surround him seem to differ about the frequency with which they think they can act above the law, and the degree to which they think society will tolerate their doing so. For the time being, most Russians find it easier to accept this state of affairs than to contest it. Clothing the whole performance in the costume of law makes such acceptance a little easier to swallow. This results in a strange double deception, in which both sides speak in a language of law that neither side truly believes to accurately describe what they're doing. This state of affairs should be familiar to Sovietologists and students of Cold War Eastern Europe. It's the same double deception that infused ideological claims in these states in their last decades of existence. The state said workers of the world unite. By the 1980s, no one, not even the state, truly believed that was the goal anymore. In fact, jokes emerged. One joke, they pretend to pay us, we pretend to work. But the jokes acknowledged a limit to the state's toleration of dissent. We all know that everyone is pretending, but in fact, we must continue to pretend. 
For most people, it is easier to accept the theater, however implausible, than to peek behind the curtain. This is not to gainsay Putin's popularity in Russia, even if it was acquired with the help of a one-sided media. Nor is it to say that the courts do not work, and often work well enough for ordinary cases. The reforms of the Yeltsin era are not to be undervalued, but they are increasingly being undermined. There is a natural tension between the regime's genuine interest in a working legal system and his continuing desire for one that remains, at key points, controllable. This is dangerous. There are different audiences to this legal theater. They have different points at which they can no longer suspend their disbelief. And the effects of destroying respect for the legal system have a very long tail. So in the next 20 minutes, I want to explore this theory based on my work on one aspect of the Kordakovsky case. I'll start with an overview of the case in a nutshell. Then I'll describe how I became involved as an expert appointed by the Kremlin's Human Rights Council to analyze the second of his two convictions and the reprisals that my fellow experts suffered as a result of their willingness take, to take on this public service without pay or privilege. Finally, I'll return to this tension that the regime exhibits in its use of legal theater, borrowing from Václav Havel. Havel, after all, was a playwright, and his parable of the green grocer may help us draw some conclusions about why the Russian legal system that has emerged after 20 years of attempts at its reform seems in some key ways so resistant to change. First, the Kordakovsky case in a nutshell. In June 2003, as I think most of you are all aware, the first criminal investigation opened against the Yukos Oil Company, then Russia's largest private oil conglomerate, with Kordakovsky as its CEO. It was followed by a series of arrests that summer and fall. A close associate of Kordakovsky, Platon Lebedev, was arrested while in hospital, and Kordakovsky himself was seized by special forces who stormed his plane in Novosibirsk. Now, Kordakovsky was arrested that morning for not appearing as a witness in response to a last-minute surprise summons issued the day before in Moscow, 1,700 miles away from where he was. Meanwhile, the Russian tax ministry served Yukos with a tax assessment demanding 2.8 billion euros. The order gave Yukos one day to pay the sum. However, that same day, the Moscow City Commercial Court enjoined Yukos from disposing of certain assets. Yukos would ultimately be bankrupted, its corporate existence terminated, and its assets largely consumed by Rosnia. Under this shadow, the first criminal trial started in July 2004 in the Mashansky District Court of the city of Moscow. Ten months later, Khodorkovsky and Lebedev were convicted of fraud, causing property damage by deceit and breach of trust, and tax evasion. Sentenced to nine years in prison, reduced modestly on appeal. The investigation and prosecution of other Yukos officials continued, and in early 2007, as Kordakovsky and Lebedev were reaching the point where they were approaching eligibility for parole, they were indicted on new criminal charges of embezzlement and money laundering. Now, these were new criminal charges, but the crimes alleged in the indictment spanned the same time period as the crimes for which the first trial court found them guilty. Thus, they were now accused of having embezzled the oil that they were previously convicted of having sold without paying taxes. The second trial took almost twice as much time as the first, ending in mid-December 2010. The day the verdict was scheduled to be read, it was postponed without explanation. The next day, during a nationwide television program, uh, Putin responded at length to a question about Kordakovsky, saying, a thief should sit in jail. Ten days later, both defendants received 14-year sentences later again, modestly reduced on appeal. Now let me introduce another player in the drama, the Kremlin Human Rights Council. Several weeks after the verdict in the second case, then-President Dmitry Medvedev met with his Human Rights Council in Yekaterinburg. You may be surprised to learn that such a creature even exists. The Council, though, claims a distinguished historical pedigree. It lacks any legal independence, its existence is wholly based on presidential ukaz, uh, but its real authority comes from the uh, moral weight uh, and reputation of its membership. At that first meeting in Yekaterinburg, several council members expressed concern about the Kordakovsky case. And at the conclusion of the meeting, President Medvedev invited the council to act. According to the stenographic record of the meeting, he said, you know, 
I think that practically no one at this table has read the entire case file for Kordakovsky, Magnitsky, or still others, simply because it's not possible. But it seems to me important, please, here I would be grateful, if the expert community tried to prepare a very legal analysis of these decisions. That would represent something of definite value, because every person who wishes to examine in those things needs to be guided by the opinions of specialists. The opinions of different people on these questions is very important to me as head of state. The council took Medvedev's words to heart. A working group chaired by Tamara Morshakova, a retired justice from the Russian Constitutional Court, invited 13 experts to participate in an analysis of the second conviction, once the appellate process had been allowed to run its course so that the experts could not be accused of tampering with an ongoing case. In the end, nine experts accepted an invitation that promised a considerable amount of work and not a kopeck in compensation. Six were Russian scholars of law or economics, three were non-Russian legal scholars from the Netherlands, Germany, and the U.S., and I was the U.S. contributor. I received my invitation, funnily enough, on April 1st, which I almost discarded thinking it was a rather unfunny April Fool's joke. <laughs> But after confirming the validity of the letter that I received from Morshikova and the chair of the council, Mikhail Fedotov, I still had to think hard about whether to get involved. The letter invited me, quote, to participate in an independent public analysis of official documents and proceedings in the case. I was invited to write an opinion within my area of expertise concerning any legal question that I believed to be pertinent. The letter made crystal clear that I would work without any interference or even communication from the council. I would not know the identity of any of the other experts, nor see their opinions, nor learn of the council's final recommendations <coughs> until all that information was publicly announced. Well, I decided to take the case, and once I did, I was confident that my analysis should be styled as if it were applying Kordakovsky's case uh, to the principles of the European Convention on Human Rights not always a popular topic in the United Kingdom, I understand, but I, needless to say, I had plenty of material to work with. Of all the states, institutions, and NGOs outside of Russia that have pressed for legal reform, the Council of Europe has had far and away the most success. Russia's continuing moratorium on the death penalty, its revision of numerous codes of law, and its reform of the education and payment of its judiciary have all been due to promises extracted in exchange for membership in the Council of Europe. The greatest promise of all was to ratify the convention and abide by the jurisdiction of the Strasbourg Court. Admittedly, by one metric, the relationship is foundered. Russia has one of the highest caseloads burdening the court's docket, cases, I hasten to add, that Russia invariably loses. It also has the, among the highest number of repeat cases on similar problems, like competent investigation of cases or degrading and inhumane prison conditions. On the other hand, up until the Kordakovsky case, Russia has unfailingly paid the money damages the court orders against it. Many of its ongoing reforms of Russian law have been catalyzed in part by the court's detailed opinions that set out the failings of Russian law and practice with exacting precision against the standards and norms that Russia accepted by ratifying the convention. Bearing this in mind, I wrote my report in that analytical style. For over a hundred pages, I argued that it was likely that the European court would find Kordakovsky's detention in the courtroom and the conditions of his confinement to be inhumane or degrading, that the judicial proceedings themselves exceeded a reasonable time, that the tribunal lacked independence and impartiality, that the verdict lacked indicia of a reasoned judgment, that he was deprived of their presumption of innocence and the right to equal rights in the court, and that the charges were lacking in the foreseeability that the convention, not to mention the rule of law, requires. In each instance, I relied on the verdict and public sources alone. I articulated the relevant Russian law or judicial decision and compared these with the norms established by the European Convention and Strasbourg precedents. Virtually every time, I found the Russian practice wanting. Now, there was an odd common theme to many of these violations, too. They exhibited a certain flagrancy about them, while at the same time the authorities insisted on the flat-out normalcy and legality of their actions in the face of even the most obvious evidence to the contrary. One almost visual example will show what I mean. The indictment in this case, as in all cases, was composed by a criminal investigator 
and handed up to the court by a prosecutor. The indictment consisted of 14 volumes and over 3,400 pages. Needless to say, being composed only by one side in an adversarial proceeding, the indictment is not the whole case. But this indictment was copied into the judge's opinion, oftentimes verbatim. And my report, which I've got here, included an appendix in which I traced and highlighted this plagiarism right down to the same typographical errors and misspellings for over 100 pages. And if you see the yellow there, that's where I found identical language. And the bold face, if you look a little closer, are inconsequential differences in the proper nouns and prepositions, uh, and sometimes correcting a misspelling uh, from the prosecutor's indictment. But the indictment itself, the trial process, the opinion, all bore the hallmark and imprimatur, the pomp and circumstance of law, right down to the seals and, whip and ribbons. It took the judge almost a week to read his 689-page judgment in the case in formal compliance with the law, but if you had to read a 689-page <laughs> document in a week, you'll understand that he read it with the lightning speed of an auctioneer rather than a judge. The eight other experts took other approaches to analyzing the case. Not all of the opinions were in accord with each other either, but they were all sent to the council, which compiled both the reports and the council's recommendations together. The chairman of the council personally delivered these to President Medvedev on December 27, 2011, the first anniversary of Khodorkovsky's second conviction. This made national news as Fedotov reminded Medvedev that the president himself had directed this work to be done. Now, this national news at that particular time was not particularly welcome. First, because the council recommended that the conviction be annulled. Second, because the news came as the Kremlin was confronting the Bolotnaya Square demonstrations, the largest public convulsion since the collapse of the Soviet Union. And third, because President Medvedev was widely expected to be replaced by then Prime Minister Putin's return to the presidency that coming spring a few months away. This is exactly what happened. And on March 12 of 2012, Putin was elected to a third term as president. Almost immediately, the Human Rights Council found itself under threat. Putin began by swelling its ranks with new members, which diluted its ability to act and deliberate. And in response, almost a quarter of the old cadre, including some of the most prominent and well-respected members, resigned en masse. On April 1, 2012, another April Fool's Day, the integrity of the Council's report was smeared in the Russian mass media with the threadbare allegation that some of the participants had received funding from Yukos in the past. The smearing was done by Vladimir Markin, who as a representative of the investigative committee that brought the Khodorkovsky case could not exactly be called a neutral bystander. Around the same time, government authorities conducted an unscheduled audit of a think tank through which a number of members of the Human Rights Council and some of the experts had participated in high-level roundtables on legal reform in the past. In July, the Basmani District Court in Moscow issued a warrant permitting investigative searches as part of the continuation of the first investigation of Khodorkovsky. That case, remember, opened in 2003 and ostensibly closed with his conviction in 2005. The first searches under this order were conducted in the think tank's offices and several associated apartments. The warrant issued by the Basmani court described the investigator's apparent theory that the think tank had received funds from Khodorkovsky that were in turn passed to members of the council and the experts in exchange for legal opinions favorable to them. One of the experts targeted was Mikhail Subotin, a senior researcher at IMAMO and the deputy director of the think tank. As he recalled, the investigators refused the request of the executive director to call a lawyer and ignored the legal requirement of independent witnesses to their activities. Instead, they seized everything from diplomas to passports, computers, flash drives, professional archives, and working papers, which brought the think tank's work to a standstill. Accountants and other employees were questioned for several days thereafter. In February 2013, Tamara Morshikova revealed what was happening at a press conference, these warrants not being conducted, uh, released uh, naturally in a, in a public hearing. Uh, and noting the investigator's apparent theory of the case, Morshikova expressed herself very forcefully uh, considering her training as a judge. The accusation is senseless, she said on television. 
fictitious. Even more, this center never conducted any kind of expert examination. It publishes monographs. In response, investigators increased the pressure. Russian and Kazakh investigators searched the apartment of Elena Novikova, the director of the think tank, who was caring at the time for her elderly father in Kazakhstan. They seized computers, phones, and papers, questioned Novikova for more than three days as a witness. At least once, the session stretched past midnight. Her lawyers complained <coughs> about the absence of a warrant, protested their exclusion during the investigative actions, but to no avail. Another expert to come under pressure was Sergei Guryev. Guryev, the rector of one of Russia's premier academic institutions, a member of the board of directors for Sperbank, and one of the most prominent and well-respected economists in Russia. After steadily increasing pressure, Guryev fled to Paris in self-imposed exile. The truth, he wrote in the New York Times, was that I could not come back to Russia because I feared losing my freedom. And after describing his work for the council, he described his treatment by the investigators. As for me, he wrote, interrogation started in February 2013. After that, I heard that in February, a colleague of Mr. Putin had talked to him about my situation, and the president had reassured the colleague that I had nothing to worry about. This did not stop the investigation. I was interrogated twice and received demands for all sorts of documents and personal information. Moreover, the investigators introduced operative measures, the police euphemism for surveillance. Interestingly, during the interrogations, the investigators asked me to produce alibis, though they did not explain for what and insisted that I was a witness, not a suspect. Guryev's institution, the Higher School of Economics, also came under pressure. Simultaneously with my questioning, he said a tax audit and a federal education and science supervisory service inspection were performed. We were told that both were normal scheduled inspections, but there had never been anything of the sort earlier. Finally, at the end of April 2013, investigators produced a warrant for all of Guryev's email traffic since 2008. Guryev said, the warrant gave no specific reasons why my emails had to be seized, yet concluded that they had to be seized. When I complained to the investigators, one of them said that I was better off than Andrei Sakharov, the Soviet dissident who was sent into internal exile in Gorky. The investigators suggested that they also had a warrant to search his home, leading Guryev to conclude the investigators can produce any search warrant they want without any respect for my rights, and they can do it without warning. Guryev later told interviewers from Der Spiegel the same mistakes in terms of names and spelling were made on both the court order and the documents the investigators presented. In other words, the court in question simply copied the investigators' documents with their absurd accusations and will continue to do so in the future. Now, my review of the documents worry of reference supports the truth of that allegation. In fact, it resonates quite nicely with the plagiarism that I found in the, uh, in the court's conviction of Kordakovsky a few years ago. After Guryev's uh, departure, the pressure continued to mount. Subotin was ordered to reappear for more questioning. He estimated for about 12 hours. Then in June, Tamara Morshakova herself was called in for questioning. The efforts of the investigative committee were not limited to the Russian experts either. Otto Luxerhant, a professor of law at the University of Hamburg, who contributed a report, was warned at the last minute not to board a plane from Hamburg to Moscow because the investiga investigative committee had requested the assistance of the German government to question him. Now, being in the United States, I felt rather out of reach of the Russian state, but I still felt its pressure. For the first time in my professional career, I found it suddenly difficult to obtain a visa to attend an academic conference in St. Petersburg to which I'd been invited to give a paper. When I wrote to my Russian colleague for help, this was his email reply. I tried to investigate during the last few days, what's the situation with your invitation? I could get almost no explanation. Our international department sent the documents to the rector's administration, which should forward them to the Federal Migration Service. I could not even know if the papers were sent. It was a completely unexplainable, non-understandable, and unpredictable situation. I saw it for the first time during my years of work at the university. I still had a little hope before your letter, but now that's gone. Morshakova summarized the first year of Putin's third term from the point of view of the experts. Medvedev had asked these scholars to give public counsel on an important criminal case. As a result, they'd been interrogated, their homes and offices searched, their personal effects seized, and their integrity smeared. Five of the six Russian experts are publicly known to have been ordered to questioning, subject to search for both. Now, how influential was Putin himself in all of this? 
In my opinion, that's an impossible question to answer today. Maybe a historian will uncover the relevant answers in the future. But at whatever level we judge Putin's personal animosity toward Khodorkovsky, or assess his degree of control over factions in the Kremlin and elsewhere, his choices and public decisions are telling. They reveal Putin calculating how far he could go to afford the legend's politics or those of his competitors to intrude into the Russian criminal justice system. One incident is telling in this score. As I mentioned, the announcement of the verdict in Khodorkovsky's second case was inexplicably delayed. The very next day, then, Prime Minister Putin held one of his marathon televised call-in programs and allowed himself a lengthy answer to a staged question about Khodorkovsky's case. Both the first conviction in 2005 and the second one yet to be announced, a rather flagrant violation of the separation of powers. The premier mixed into his remarks several references to popular culture, at one point quoting from a 1979 Soviet miniseries, Miesto Strechi Izmini Nilzia, in which a detective played by Vladimir Vysotsky declared a thief should sit in jail. Now what I found interesting was Putin didn't finish the quote. But the second half of that line was widely familiar to his viewing audience. A thief should sit in jail, the quote goes, and people don't care how I put him away. Let me now wrap up this picture by returning to my central argument about legal theater. My central proposition to you is that the Kremlin believes that there is a particular value to be had in asserting that people don't care how I put him away. Putin wanted, needed, to be seen not just to bend the law to achieve his preferred outcomes, but to do so while insisting, ridiculously, that the law is rigorously observed. Lesser officials were keen to follow his example. A regime that can do that demonstrates its power over society, at least until they go too far and exceed the limits of public toleration. Why this is so was explained by Václav Havel in what came to be called the parable of the green grocer. The grocer, a stand-in for the common man, is ordered to put a sign in his window saying workers of the world unite. Why does he do it? He doesn't believe the slogan. At best, he's indifferent to the message or knows it rings hollow in his world. But he puts the sign in his window, willingly becoming a cog in the machine that will ultimately grind him down. And he does so, Havel says, because these things must be done if one is to get along in life. But Havel notes that there's a limit to getting along a limit known by both the grocer and the regime. And here's what Havel says. Let us take note. If the green grocer had been instructed to display the slogan, I am afraid and therefore unquestioningly obedient, he would not be nearly as indifferent to its semantics, even though the statement would reflect the truth. The green grocer would be embarrassed and ashamed to put such an unequivocal statement of his own degradation in the shop window. And quite naturally so, for he is a human being and thus had a sense of his own dignity. To overcome this complication, his expression of loyalty must take the form of a sign which, at least on its textual surface, indicates a level of disinterested conviction. It must allow the green grocer to say, what's wrong with the workers of the world uniting? Thus, the sign helps the green grocer to conceal from himself the low foundations of his obedience, at the same time concealing the low foundations of power. It hides them behind the facade of something high. In Havel's Czechoslovakia, that something was ideology. As my reliance on Havel suggests, in one sense, this is an old argument. That's what regimes do when they conduct fraudulent elections or insist on public allegiance to empty ideology. In Putin's Russia, that something is law. This makes for a slightly newer argument. It's rarer to see regimes play with law in this way, especially when they recognize, as Russia does, that the law is an important institution for promotion, for promoting foreign investment, the preservation of their social order, and the reduction of social tensions. Once an election is over, it's done. There's nothing to argue about but the past once you get over the, the protests. But law continues day after day after day. Russian law, like the late Soviet state and its ideology, is now underperforming and will continue to do so as long as this legal theater is thought to be useful. But that's a very precarious balance with very high risks. As Havel's Green Grocer demonstrates, this manipulation of law relies on the complacency of the society in which it occurred. For now, most Russians pay little attention to trials like Khodorkovsky's or the abuse of legal uh, procedure to threaten the Human Rights Council's experts and send a message to others. There's enough theater for the average Russian to imagine that there must be fire where there's smoke, 
to satisfy himself that elites simply fight among themselves and that the general order of things will just continue on as always. There's an irony here, and on that I'll conclude. The change Havel sought in his society requires the greengrocer to refuse to put his sign in the window. But that's not enough. Others must see his civil disobedience and be inspired by it. In that way, the workers of the world actually would unite, just as the sign they refuse to display instructs them to do. This is also a form of theater that sends a message to its intended audience. But when the medium of the message is the legal system itself, its manipulation by either the actors or the audience is a very dangerous thing indeed. Thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you very much.